Module 5, Objective 10, explain how white and gray matter is organized in the spinal cord and describe the specific roles for each uh, tissue type. The spinal cord is housed within protective membranes called the meninges and within the vertebral column. If you recall, uh, the vertebrae contain a body and the vertebral arch. And it's the vertebral arch that creates the vertebral foramen right here that carries the spinal cord from the um, foramen magnum of the occipital bone um, all the way down to about L2, L3 where um, the spinal cord effectively ends uh, and what's left are just the various nerves that, that run or emanate from the spinal cord. In terms of sectional anatomy of the spinal cord, we have two types of matter, white and gray. What makes white matter white is the presence of myelinated axons. Remember, myelin is a fatty substance, and it looks white, just like um, fat on meat is white prior to cooking. So hence the name, the white matter. Gray matter um, is more centralized in the spinal cord, and we'll see an image soon. And it's going to contain mainly cell bodies and neuroglia and unmyelinated axons. And it's divided into projections that are called the gray horns. The gray matter, masses of gray matter in the central nervous system are called nuclei. And they're organized into regions called horns, of which there are three. You have the posterior horn horns, one on either side, the anterior horns, and the lateral horns. The posterior horns carry somatic and visceral sensory nuclei. So these are incoming sensations from receptors. The anterior horns carry somatic motor nuclei. These are outgoing, um, heading to the uh, what we call effectors. And then the lateral horns um, are only found in the thoracic and lumbar segments, and they're going to carry visceral motor nuclei. Again, outgoing. The cell bodies of neurons form functional groups that are called nuclei. And there's two main types, sensory nuclei and motor nuclei. Sensory nuclei are dorsally oriented uh, within the spinal cord, and they're going to connect again to the peripheral receptors. Motor nuclei are ventrally oriented, connecting to the peripheral effectors. Here's a um, cross-section of a spinal cord. I'm going to jump to this. It may be a little easier to see. So the gray matter is localized um, here, centralized. Often it's um, either referred to as an H or an upside-down butterfly what have you. Uh, gray matter is more central. It is um, surrounding a canal in the middle called the central canal. I don't think that term is anywhere on here. Um, but that is your gray matter, and it's divided into horns, and we can see them over here. So the posterior, lateral, and anterior horns. Okay. In addition, <coughs> we have uh, two roots that come off of the spinal cord. There is a dorsal root and a ventral root. It's easy to identify the dorsal root because it has a very large bulge nor known as the dorsal root ganglion. Um, the dorsal root is responsible for carrying sensory. Oops, oh, right there. While the ventral root carries a uh, motor commands. So sensory is going to travel in that direction to the central nervous system, while motor travels away from the central nervous system to the effectors. White matter is organized into tracks, and these are bundles of axons within the central nervous system. They relay the same type of information in the same direction. 
So your ascending tracks carry sensory information while your descending tracks carry motor commands. Let's uh, go back to the image to show the, the white matter. Um, so the white matter is organized into tracks and columns and here is a posterior white column. We have the anterior white column and then of course the lateral white column over here. And I'm sorry that it's a little bit messy, uh, but that's how that's organized. So gray matter is covered by a thick layer of white matter. The white matter consists of ascending and descending axons organized into columns. And they contain axon bundles, each with specific functions. In fact, the spinal cord is so highly organized, it's possible to predict the results of injuries if you know where the damage occurs. So in addition to that, we've looked at the two roots that come off of the spinal cord, the, the pairs of roots. So the dorsal and the ventral roots they join to form the spinal nerve and sorry to do it but I'm going to jump back to that image again ah, I'll stick with this one so the dorsal root and let me just change colors for contrast Maybe let's go green the dorsal root is here the ventral root is here they join to form the spinal nerve uh, perhaps it's easier to see over here they join to form the spinal nerve. So spinal nerves or pair of spinal nerves emerge laterally from each spinal cord segment. They form by the junction of the anterior and posterior roots. Uh, we call them dorsal and ventral, but anterior and posterior work as well. Um, so anterior is ventral and posterior is dorsal. All spinal nerves are mixed meaning they carry both sensory, i.e. the dorsal, and motor, i.e. the ventral. So peripheral nerves form from the branching and the resorting of spinal nerves. All are mixed, sensory and motor, and they have the same connective tissue layers that we found in the spinal cord. So it's a continuous um, connective tissue layer surrounding the spinal cords and the spinal nerves. All right, so let's look at the peripheral distribution of spinal nerves. We'll start with motor nerves, and uh, if we consider the dorsal and ventral rami, um, we have two main rami, the dorsal and ventral. All right, so here is your dorsal root, here is your ventral root. We know that they join to form the spinal nerve, almost immediately as soon as the spinal nerve is created you get branches and this is where the rami come in so you get one branch which is the dorsal ramus you get a second branch which is the ventral ramus the dorsal ramus is going to head to the skeletal muscles of the back okay so that's the motor end of it they're also going to uh, run to the um, postganglionic fibers of the smooth muscles and glands of the back. So the dorsal ramus covers the back. The ventral ramus is going to cover the body walls and the limbs. Okay, so almost as immediately after the spinal nerve is formed, you get branching in these peripheral nerves. Uh, the dorsal ramus covers the back, the ventral ramus covers um, the sides and the limbs. There are other details, but we're not going to discuss them in this class. Now, since all spinal nerves are mixed, you also have to consider the sensory portion. And in addition to the motor impulses, um, all of these peripheral nerves carry sensory information as well. So we have the same rami. Here's the dorsal ramus um, and right underneath the ventral ramus. So in terms of sensory, the dorsal ramus is going to cover um, introceptors of the back and exteroceptors of the back, while the ventral ramus covers, again, the body wall and the limbs.
A dermatome is a specific bilateral region of skin supplied by a single pair of spinal nerves. So the spinal nerves um, are mapped out. And this, you know, we'd said earlier that you can predict uh, the resulting injury if you know exactly which part of the spinal cord is injured. And that's due to the dermatome, the fact that we all share a, the same type of mapping um, associated with our spinal cord. So it's very easy to predict. Peripheral neuropathies are regional losses of neural function that affect the regions of the dermatomes. Um, peripheral neuropathies are caused by trauma to the nerve, compression. Some illnesses can cause peripheral neuropathies, but they can lead to um, either loss of sensation or loss of motor control in a particular dermatome. So I'm just going to use a very crude example. Um, if we were to damage this particular nerve, the thoracic eight, this region of the skin may lose sensation. Um, you may lose your sense of feeling in that region of the skin, or you may lose motor control of that region, and that is peripheral neuropathy. Um, shingles is a, uh, a viral infection that causes a rash or symptoms that occur along dermatomes. Um, often people describe shingles as leading to these weird patterned rashes that just happen to be along this, these same dermatomes.